Hey everyone, welcome to the Wednesday live stream. I had to put this mic to play because this one that cost $700, even though I just spent two hours charging it, is telling me there's no charge. So the sound will be different. I apologize. If it's a train wreck, we'll work on it. But it should be working and uh, we're going to move on. So one of the questions we got in the early chat, which if you don't know, we hang out. We had over, we had 111 people kind of the hour before we went live and we chat, we talk, we answer questions. It's a good way to get your questions answered because with only 111 people, I can kind of wrangle a bunch of you with 1300 people like we had last week, really hard, right? So we're going to answer a question that someone asked me and I thought this is a good question to start with. And that was, was it scary to start your store and has YouTube had a big impact? So starting the store is probably the scariest thing we ever did. And I say we because it was my wife and I, my fiance, maybe only girlfriend at the time. Uh, because I had to step away from a job that I had at a fish store. So I got to like, okay, I'm going to quit my job. And I, had a, I have a silent business partner. He invests money. And then I have to buy supplies and we have to build a store and we have to search for a location like, so what I did is I left my old job and I want to say, I think I knew I was going to start it like at the beginning, like not the beginning of the year, but like I knew it was time to leave. And I don't, I don't remember exactly why it was like that month. It's been a long time now. So my wife had just posted it like we've been open over six years at this point. Um, but I don't know why it was that, but I knew that I gave my current employer a month. Maybe it was three months. I feel like, yeah, I think it was three months. I think in September, I knew that it was like time for me to move on. And so I think I actually ended up working until um, like the beginning of December. And then we were able to find where we were going to put the store, uh, I think two days before Christmas. So it was like the 23rd-ish. And we signed and that was like the scariest part because at that point, I was a guy that made, I want to say I made less than $2,000 a month. And I was signing a lease, a three-year lease, to pay like a thousand dollars a month. And like, if this fish store didn't work, it was financial ruin. Like, just even that little piece would financially ruin me. You know, like, oh, this didn't work. Three years, three months later, I got to close the store, but I now have a thousand-dollar payment for the next three years. Um, and I got very good advice from the person that built my store, and they were basically like, "Look, this is either going to work or it isn't." What's going to happen is you're either going to go bankrupt or you will make it. So, like, that's all you can, there's no in between there. It's not like you didn't make it and now you're just going to pay off the debt. Like, you're going to end up in so much debt and you're going to have all these, like, leases and things that are going to hang over you. You will be forced to file bankruptcy. So, just don't worry about that part and worry about being successful. Like, you can't, if, if you put all the energy into being successful, you might make it. If you're only half trying to make it and half trying to not fail, you're not going to make it. And so with that, I signed on the line that, uh, you know, I was now a leaseholder for at least three years and we started building. And I, at that time I had $50,000 in cash. And then the, the friend and the builder that helped me build the place was willing to do everything on credit. He himself knowing that if I failed, he was never going to get paid, right? But we wrote down all the hours and all the materials that he donated. Like, we still had to buy tons of stuff. Like, I remember one day um, from Tacoma Screw, I bought $800 in bolts, nuts, and washers. Like, and then I remember buying screws and paint and, like, all these things. When you built out a business plan, no way. I, I was like, oh, yeah, I need some stuff. Yeah, it'll cost, like, $1,000 in stuff, you know, like. You know, and maybe like a thousand dollars in wood, and then like, but all the little things you kept buying over and over and over again added up to an insane amount of money. And we actually ran out of money, so we built the first rack of tanks to the store. It was forty-two tanks, and we kind of just had to get the doors open. It had been at that point, it was April, so we signed right before Christmas, and it was April, so it was like four months of building auto water change system. Because that's one thing I knew I didn't want to compromise building it correctly. Like we were running out of money. But I knew from working at other fish stores, once it's built, you never tear it back down and redo it. And so 
I had to had to keep going. We did that. We we filled a lot of the space with like house plants. Cause they're kind of cheap and they kind of fit the vibe and everything. And <clears throat> I wasn't getting paid, so we were on month um, month four, right? Kind of month well month five of me not making any money. My wife still worked, which was lucky. Not lucky planned, I guess. Tough. A lot of ramen nights, that type of thing. Um, we kicked the door open midway through April and we make like ten thousand dollars the first month so it's like oh my god yes right but at the same time all of that money would go straight back into buying more stock more lights like I barely could put enough lights even on the tanks right I bought the cheapest lights possible and like really shoestring budget like money would come in money would go out money would come in money would go out it was really tight um, and it was that way for probably the first year I remember at like the the year mark, like I want to say that following January, I was like, I got to start paying myself something because we're going into debt at home, right? Like the store's basically in debt. I'm in debt. And so we had to start paying. So I started paying myself $500 a month. And, you know, it, it we kind of built up from there. And then the scariest point, I mean, it was scary the whole time. And when I, when I talk about scary, it's not like – not being scared but it's very stressful every single day every time something goes wrong every time dead batch of fish or just something would go wrong we knew that the money was very thin uh the like the quintessential point of that is when the 360 gallon 340 gallon tank glass tank burst its seams and flooded my entire store that almost put us out of business even with having neighbors that were cool on both ends it didn't sue me because the water went into both buildings next door. One was a tattoo parlor, one was a floral shop. Their stores got shut down. I was shut down for an entire weekend. Lots of merchandise got destroyed. A lot of animals died, unfortunately. Like all that kind of stuff happened And buying the commercial dehumidifiers and the carpet blowers and all these things to repair what had happened um, basically put us down again where now at this point we had employees, but we also, I remember having less than $2,000 in the bank for the aquarium co-op and payroll would have been you know a thousand dollars let's say every two weeks at that point and we still had to buy fish we still had to replace the stock we, we lost all the sales from being closed down and it was a scary time to rebuild like i don't know if you guys can relate unless you've been in a business where any business that's like a retail store and you know the bank account has two thousand dollars that's literally crawling back out of the like out of the hole like there is no other way to explain it there was no like oh don't worry next next week we'll be at fifty thousand dollars in the bank account or anything like that like it was literally every decision like every fish i bought i wanted to go buy in person just so i could make sure it wouldn't die all these things i could do to possibly dig out of this hole because that was make it or break it like that was going to put us out or we were going to be able to make it through that and we did make it through it and so Yes, very scary, very nerve-wracking. Um, you know, my wife, I would say it was probably hardest on my wife getting the brunt of it because when I say the brunt of it is, one, I'm on edge because it's very difficult, right? Two, I'm putting in ridiculously long hours, you know? So at that time, we had to live. My wife had a job that was an hour and a half away, maybe even two hours away from the store. So we lived halfway in between the two. So it was 45 minutes to an hour each way to the store and same for her going to work. And so let's say I want to get there an hour early to open the store and we opened it, uh, we opened at noon. So I'd, I'd leave my house at 10, but then I'd also get home at like 10 or nine. And then the days that I had to go pick out fish, I might leave at 7 a.m. and get home at 10. And so there was, we weren't seeing each other a lot and I was on edge, money was tight, all the things that could be like going bad kind of are. And so yes, very stressful. But you know, if we go to like the three three year mark, I basically went three years without being on YouTube. You know, and I was kind of on YouTube. Like we did like five videos, like the oldest of the old videos. And um you know, at that point I wanna say over the course of a year working ten, twelve hours a day, my salary at end of year three was about forty thousand dollars now to some of you that would sound like oh man that's a crazy amount of money you know like depending on where your local economy is but our local economy that's not very much at all but combined with my wife's income was enough to sustain the problem is 
zero vacations and my wife can attest to this like i asked if her if i could work a half day on the day we got married um and then i worked the day before and the day after we didn't take a honeymoon till like the next year because i couldn't get away from the store didn't have enough employee coverage that kind of stuff so like that's the level of commitment i was at working seven days a week at least 12 hours a day because while i was in the store that didn't account for paperwork so i'd still do paperwork either in the morning or at night be paying b and o taxes and and just ordering stuff and doing all that so that was like the sacrifice to make that forty thousand dollars and it only made sense if it ever got better than that right so luckily at at some point we were still at that house that was it's it's on the channel like the oldest fish room i had basically um we were still at that house and i remember i was just gonna go full into youtube and uh you know, my wife was worried because she knows I get obsessive about things. And, you know, I, I kind of was thinking about it like this is what has to happen. Like either A, I should go get another job. Like, because obviously, I say obviously, but I'm a reasonably intelligent person. I could be making someone else money. I don't doubt I could at that point I couldn't have just like gotten a job that's like, oh, it's paying me 50 or 60K and I work 40 hours instead of 120, right? Or 100. And so... I knew that something had to, something had to like we had to go online or we had to bring way more people into the store. At that point, the the store would generate about three hundred sixty thousand dollars gross over the entire year. So that averages out to you know like thirty thousand dollars a month, and it was enough to get me forty thousand dollars in profit, which was my wage. And we had to scale that because I couldn't I couldn't sustain no days off and 100 plus hour work weeks forever. Like that's not sustainable. Like that's obviously, no one can do that. Oh, I shouldn't say no one, but no one wants to do that. Um, and so that's what led us to led me to YouTube. And it was my first thought of, if I can get this marketing working, it could potentially bring us in more. And so the second part of her question was, I assume it's a her, I don't know why, uh, was has YouTube made a big impact? So now, if we know in the first three years, like my first epic years, 360, not first year, but like 360,000 is what I could get to. Last year, the aquarium co-opted 2.5 million, right? So obviously our overhead is way, way, way higher, you know? So it's not like, you know, it's not like, oh, Corey took home $2 million. Like not, nothing even remotely close to that, right? Um, Cause now instead of having just me and Lamont or Lamont and myself, now I have nearly 15 employees, right? And we've got benefits and we've got all these things we do, right? And we've got consultants and we have a bookkeeper and an accountant. We have all these facets of things we're doing. And, uh, but yeah, so clearly now I make a salary that's worth my time. That's definitely true. And I hope that I'm able to pay a salary that's worth everyone's time. Jimmy, you know, my wife works for us. We've got Randy, we've got all these people you guys have kind of seen and know, and they're coming aboard because we're able to pay them. And so yes, YouTube, has been very good to me, but I still work just as many hours. So that's still the big problem is I'm working a hundred plus hours, right? So the money aspect we fixed. Now the aspect is how do we, um, how do we make it so I only work like 40 or 50 hours, like something reasonable that doesn't lead to, um, you know, let's say an ulcer, heart condition. Like I need to free up more time to exercise, just be away from fish. Like, you guys may have noticed you follow me for a long time. If I go on vacation, which we do once a year for my wife, I come back and I'm super energized. And I want to do more stuff. If I think if we were able to do something, if I had time off every week, I'd be like that every week. So that's the struggle now is free up time, hire people, free up time, see what we can do and have more fun. So that's where we're, you know, that's what we're shooting for. Oh yeah, my wife says we figured out Corey was paying himself twenty cents an hour for his first paychecks for a while. That's that's legitimately true. Like it was laughable how little I was paying myself, but there was no other option. I just even right now, right now with both my accountant and my bookkeeper, they say you need to be worried you're not paying yourself enough. And what I mean by that is we're going to start triggering audits because I don't pay myself enough. Like a company that makes $2.5 million, they don't expect you just to make like $60,000. Like you own the company and you're only taking home 60 grand. Like 
you have to prove to them like, well, all the money's going towards employees and building infrastructure and all that. They just assume like the money's disappearing somewhere. Like, yes, I keep buying this product over here and then I return it for gift cards or something. So I have to pay myself more on the advice of my my bookkeeper and uh, accountant. So it's one of those that I genuinely try to just grow as big as we can and not you know, be so profit driven to myself. Overall, yes, like we want to do bigger and better things. So, uh, but no, I thought that was a good question. I thought it was a good way to start off because I know there's just thousands and thousands of people that are new. I mean, we're going to hit 255,000 subscribers and I probably haven't told that story since we had 100,000 or something. And so, you know, you kind of just see this YouTuber, he's got a bunch of bunch of people watching him, probably successful, probably rich, you know, probably has 10 Lamborghinis, all that stuff. Um, but I don't like, you know, I, I try not to forget where we came from and try not to forget where other people are. Like 10 years ago, I'm just a hobbyist, just like you. Like I, I literally am just buying like, oh, I bought this cause I want to try it, you know, and it's coming from my paycheck because I work for someone else and that's what I do, right? So whenever I'm analyzing products, I'm trying to go, is this worth someone's money? Will they buy it? You know, like it doesn't make sense. Like, like I fought myself on the 800 gallon for a very long time. And the reason being, it was a very big expense, $15,000 for the company. And I know not everyone can connect with it. Like, you know, you get the must be nice to spend $15,000 on an aquarium. And the answer is like, yes, it is. But at the same time, you know, it does do some advertising for us and it, I do have fun with it, you know, so, but I almost never bought one. And it was purely because I want to make sure I'm staying as grounded as possible, you know, and that means keeping small aquariums, you know, not just like, oh, I've got 10 aquariums, they're all 2,000 gallons or more, or 5,000 gallons or more, you know, I forget what it's like to have a, a water parameter fluctuate, that type of thing. Um, yeah, but I do have some new toys. Someone was asking me if I knew of a good constant uh, nitrate monitor, and to me, I don't know of one, because most of the nitrate monitors you have to recalibrate all the time, like once a month at least, and so, I'm too lazy to do that, but I did buy this thingy. I, I searched on Amazon, and if you guys want to buy one, even though I haven't tested it yet, it's an analytical instrument. Ooh, but it, it's going to continually measure pH, which I don't care about, uh, and TDS. So really, I don't even know if I'm going to hook up the, the pH probe, but I want to hook up the TDS, and now the people that know me for a long time are like, I thought you didn't measure TDS. Well, that is mostly true. Let's see, am I out of here or what? mostly true what is this frustration free packaging and i dropped it uh but there are some limited cases i want to use it and that is like right now i've got a bunch of meds in the 800 gallon right and so i know i've got flubendazole which is not an easy drug to get a hold of and it lingers in the system for a long time i want to hook up this meter that tells me how much TDS is going to be in there all the time. Like I can plug it in. It's it's a continuous one. That's what I want. I want to mount it so I can see it all the time. And then I can watch the TDS drop as I do water changes to get it out of the water. <clears throat> Knowing that if I test my tap water, I can then know where I'm trying to get to. And then I can monitor it long term as I load up more fish and I'm you know doing things like clams, for instance. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, clams are going to release calcium into the water and that type of stuff and I want to make sure that never gets too high for like the clown loaches and so I just wanted a visual thing that I could look at this is I have to calibrate this one no this is the TDS one I believe uh, it also so the two things I want to do it does TDS and this one over here is pH slash temp let me see if that'll focus in on that for you so yeah one is pH and temp I'm just gonna have the other one be on temp all the time so I could just 24 7 monitor my temperature and my TDS. The pH, because I do so many water changes, uh, shouldn't be that much of an issue. But this is a toy that was like, I want to say it was like 80 bucks. And if it's super cool, I'll let you know. Uh oh, is my internet already breaking? I don't know. It doesn't look that way. Let's see if my wife's telling me. It fixed itself. Uh oh. I don't know what to tell you guys other than I tried to, I tried to buy the answer and the answer didn't work. So. Someone asked, what is TDS? TDS is total dissolved solids, and that's just fancy wordage for everything that's in your water. 
for the most part. You could definitely get um you could definitely get into some semantics there, but on a very broad level, everything that's in your water it can test. Let's just leave it at that. Um Yeah, I don't know what to do about this internet connection. My wife is blowing me up right now with uh broke at five nineteen. She's keep says she's keeping a log and will let me know. Like if it's a time related thing, that'd be useful. Um but yeah, I ordered a, a different network card to try and eliminate that. It was the wrong wrong slot. I didn't have that one free, so now I gotta uh buy a different one. But you know, trust me. Oh, is this thing wireless? No, not at all. This thing could not be more hardwired with more redundancy. I literally had a line run from the pole straight to this building that's straight to this computer. Like there there is the least amount of steps between the internet and me possible. Like that is just a true thing. Um but, you know, equipment can fail, we can overload equipment, things can happen. Maybe there's on my motherboard stock there's a slight problem. We'll diagnose it, you know. I don't want to basically I want to continue the fish talk and if it you know. Whoa, what do we got? All right. I, just broke the internet. I think it I works fine. Oh, you're saying hi? Yeah. What's your goal for 2019, Jimmy? Someone's asking what our goals are. Jimmy says get more fish. All more right. Tanks. Let's get those tanks. Oh, he's spilling the beans. I didn't. So we, I've got a bunch of... Um, I've got a bunch of tanks and some stands and things like that that we're planning to set up. And so that's in the to film category, but now the cat's kind of out of the bag. So uh, more smaller stuff. Why doesn't the 800 gallon auto water change? It does. It completely does. So yeah, it definitely auto water changes. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I'm going to keep moving on with what I was talking about. Originally, oh, I, I do want to let you know I found out something. So of the non-gaming YouTubers, so let's let's think about that. So of people who are on YouTube but aren't gamers, my live streams are doing well. And the reason I know this is because I had a meeting with YouTube yesterday about memberships and that type of thing. They reached out to me because clearly I'm doing something right. And so by you guys becoming members, you're making YouTube aware of me and you guys showing up, that helps. Now it hasn't really done anything that they can, that they don't say it does anything for me specifically, but I'm hoping to get into their beta program. And if that happens, um, I can offer you guys more options for like being a member and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So by helping me, it's going to help you in a long roundabout way. If you want to become a member, that's super cool. You, the, the biggest benefit, like I had a gripe for them and then like, it already does that. And I was like, Oh, so it turns out the, uh, becoming a member, you don't have to wait the 60 seconds to leave a, a comment. You can just like type at a normal pace. Now I ask you, those that are members, don't just spam, obviously. Like that's a problem. But uh, it does allow you that capability. You get a, access to the emojis, the behind the scene pictures. And they're supposed to be, they're, they're claiming they're developing more features. Now as a beta tester, so um, yeah, that's kind of what it is. So I appreciate everyone that is okay so it's not even the internet someone says well hopefully we come back it says we're connected back i really do apologize for this i will prove it to you let me grab the thing like i swear i ordered it so i promise you I actually, and the reality is, all right, I've disconnected the ethernet cable. This is the best shot I've got. So far it hasn't reconnected, I don't think. We're hoping it reconnects very soon. All I can anyway, we're going to go off Wi-Fi. If this thing works flawlessly off this Wi-Fi, which I realize it could be laggy, I, I get it. Then we, at least, we crowdsource between you guys and me. 
that it is a bad network or bad ethernet connection on that motherboard and buying the new one will fix it. Even though I already bought one, I'll buy another new one. And uh, hopefully we'll just get through this. So yesterday I was, uh, we drove all day basically to go pick up the biggest stockpile of mag floats any person has ever seen. So we went and we bought, I think it was like $5,000 worth of mag floats. Why would you do that, I would say? Uh, because it allowed us to get the cheapest price possible. So what that means is we're now selling mag floats. You might have seen this on the community page. We're selling mag floats at the legally lowest price we can. So there's a minimum advertised price. We are now at that. We used to be higher. Like we used to have to sell each one for like $10 more than it should have had to because we couldn't get a good price. Um, so now it's much lower. If you're into mag floats, grab some. And uh, if you're not, don't. But that's what we're trying to do. We're buying in um, big quantities and then we're trying to lower the price for you guys. That's that's our move, basically. That's our, that's our move. We've got a thousand people and only a hundred likes. Well, to be fair, my live stream is terabad today, so I don't even hold you accountable for not liking that much. But if you would, if if you're in favor of the Wi-Fi not cutting out right now, give it that thumbs up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, bought a bunch of mag floats. It was a long trip. Had to bring out the U-Haul, pick up tons. We got tons in the warehouse. If you guys need one, know that I have the lowest price that I'm legally allowed to sell it. Now, that does not mean that I am the lowest price. There is a couple people on Amazon that are like a dollar cheaper and they are illegally selling it. So know that if you buy it from them, they're technically breaking the law and that that's that. I, like, I, I'm not going to break the law to, to match Amazon at this point. And from talking with Magfloat and stuff like that, they have lawyers tracking down who's breaking the law and they're getting letters. So, um... Yeah, that's where we're at with that. I want to answer some super chats and stuff. You might have noticed in the chat that um, my brain doesn't work. That I'm not answering all super chats. So what I've decided is I've decided that not every super chat is a good comment. Now, what does that mean? That you know, if if Billy Bob two one six three says, "Hey, dudes, that's cool." Like I don't know that I need to necessarily read that out. Like I appreciate the money. But my goal is to keep the conversation flowing and I don't want to leave people in the chat left out. So I, I just want, I want it to be like, well, 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 no knowledge that just because you super chat doesn't mean I will answer it. Now, if it's a great question, I'm gonna answer regardless, but people get super offended when they're like, I gave him $3, I got him dance like a monkey, like I told him to. So yeah, but we got a $20 super chat. Uh, Kennedy is new to the hobby with a newly planted bow front tank, a 48 gallon with no lid. I need some stocking options that include peaceful fish, some of which are either big and colorful or have big personalities. So I think that's a common thing that everyone wants. Everyone wants lots of color, lots of personality. Basically, I want my aquarium to be awesome. Yes. Uh, but you don't have a lid. So that hampers you a little bit. Uh, in that tank, my go-tos for big and colorful would be platies and a pearl garami then fill in with like some corridoras fill in with some tetras or rasboras like kind of get that schooling going back and forth and uh you, you got one pearl garami so showpiece fish then you can get different colored you know four inch platies that will have some babies you'll get some action going on in there i think you'll enjoy all of that so yeah Lisa asks, I know nothing about YouTube monetizing. Does it benefit you if I watch all the way through the ads? Uh, Lisa, I honestly don't know the answer. I haven't seen any studies based on, do I get any more money if you watch more of the ad? To the best of my knowledge, I think I get the same amount, you know, that fraction of a cent, uh, whether you watch five seconds or you watch the whole thing. The biggest thing you guys can do, honestly, is watch a video for the entire thing. Like, like if you just, if you click in, hit the like button and click out, that's actually really, really bad for my channel. But if you click in and you watch a video the entire length, 
it builds up a ton of watch time and YouTube's like, man, this guy, people are watching what he does. We need to put more people in front of this guy. So the best thing you could do, and honestly, if you watched every video beginning to end every single time, that literally would probably make me more money than you buying stuff on my website, super chatting me, doing any of those things. Like it's such a powerful thing because it's kind of a snowball thing. It's like, oh, if, if YouTube sees everyone's watching me, then companies will see like, oh man, everyone on YouTube's watching Corey. Let's sell that to him cheaper. So that way he sells our product. And so like it's a big thing that kind of just keeps going. And I realize that is the most expensive thing I could ask of you is like to watch an entire video because you might be like, I hate plants. I don't even want to watch that video. I get it. Uh, so your attention is the like the most precious thing that we can possibly ask for. And I realize it's a big ask, like watch my video beginning to end. Don't hit skip. Every time you, every time you skip ahead, it penalizes us on YouTube. That's the reality. Um, but no, I appreciate anyone that will sit through ads, anyone that becomes a member, anyone that becomes a premium member, anyone that buys from us, all of this are good things. I kind of look at the platform in general as each person does their thing. And with all of you doing all of your things, it all comes together to let me do my thing. Right? So like one of my, one of my things that I would love to, um, express to you guys, if you're gonna super chat me, I would prefer it as a member. So what does that mean? That means like, like Twin City Guppies just super chatted me five bucks. I haven't read his thing yet. But if he wasn't a member yet, I'd prefer you become a member because I do believe that if we had a bunch of members, YouTube will do something with that. Like I just, I just know that's powerful. When you get massive amounts of people doing something, people take notice. Now I assume they probably, you know, if, if we did a billion dollars in super chats, they'd notice that too. But I like the I like the member thing because you also get more residual benefits and that kind of stuff and uh, yeah so that's just what's on my mind so let's answer that uh, oh <laughs> Twin Cities says where to go oh dang it so many super chats will you dance like a monkey I won't that, see the truth is like I've been to Kingley's house and I will dance like a monkey but I would only do it in a joke. Like there are people who be like, oh, I'm gonna make them do stuff. Like I'll never do that. Like that's just, that's just like belittling yourself. But I'm the first person to belittle myself. Like if it's fun, like if you guys have met me in person at shows, you know I'm geeky and I'll do anything. Like it's just nerd time, right? Um, but yeah, you know you never want to be like, wait, I'll make fun of myself. But if you're making fun of me, how dare you? You know. Which brings me to my next point. Uh, we've got a couple of conventions coming up this year. I'm doing my part to bring the pain. So what that means is, I know we just signed on to another event. Locally, we're doing ReefWorks. We're gonna have a booth. That's in Seattle area. First time local people will be able to chance to get one of these red aquarium co-op shirts, yeah. So make sure you attend that. We're also doing Aquashella in Dallas, Texas. We're doing the Aquatic Experience in New Jersey. We're doing Aquashella in Chicago. We're doing AGA in Washington here. All of those are for sure aquarium co-op and peeps will be there. Now we plan to add more stuff. I plan to do more traveling and all that, but I want to keep saying those things. So you're like, oh wait, that's by me. Cause every time I do an event, why didn't anyone tell me you were going to be in my state? And it's like, I did it 76 times. You should have paid attention. Uh, so, you know, aquarium co-op coming to a place near you. Follow us on Facebook. That's where we have the calendar. If you want to know where we're going to be and give away free crap, that's where we'll be. So I appreciate the memberships rolling in from Tiffany White, uh, RJ Riz, and Alex P. Dennis Tang's got a 65-gallon acrylic tank with some fancy goldfish. Every time he changes the water, the pH will drop by 0.2 to 0.3. Homemade canister, it's got some 10 gallon sponge filters, some Java Fern, Anubius, and the pH is 7.1. My other tank is 7.2, so let me, let me digest that. The pH is dropping by 0.2 to 0.3 from the tank. Okay, so here's what's probably going on. This is like on the fly here. A lot of times when there's a higher pH in your tap water, the uh, mun municipalities will inject a bunch of CO2 in there. And when you inject a bunch of CO2 into water, it lowers the pH. That means it's a safe drinking level and all that. So when we drink it, great. It's all good, right? 
but in your aquarium, it's gonna come in at a lower pH, and then as we bubble off that CO2, it's gonna rise back up. So we had a bunch of CO2 in there, and then we dissipate that CO2 out, naturally our pH rises again. So at the beginning it drops, hopefully it's coming back up. Uh, the other thing it could be, it could be that your pH out of the tap is lower, right? And, uh, or wait, yes, is lower, and you've got stuff in your aquarium that raises it up. So like maybe uh, clamshells like in my puffer tank or crushed coral or something like that. In which case, I don't think 0.2 to 0.3 is that big of a dip to like be worried about. Um, but those are the scenarios that I could play out in a short manner of time. And hopefully one of those is what you're running into and you're like, dang, that solves the question, mystery solved. And the way to test 100% that CO2 in the water thing, get a glass of water, put an air stone in it, let it run overnight. Uh, test it if the pH is is higher than it was when it came out of the tap. You know it's CO2 going on. Easy peasy. All right. Uh, David says there are non-publicized secret co-op benefits and special Corey offers to members from time to time. I recommend becoming a member. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to like. I don't want to say like, oh man, the craziest crap's going down behind the scenes. You guys got no idea what you're missing. It's insane back there. No, but the reality is I try to make an, a dedicated effort to like, here's a cool picture, maybe here's a discount code, here's a thing I saw, here's an extra thing. Like, I'm not trying to withhold anything from you guys. Like, you know, I'm not like, oh man, I'm a, I'm a not take care of the people that got me here. But my job is like, how do I, how do I explain this? So like, if my job is to do this, and then there's some people paying me a little bit more, I got to give them a little bit more than what they would have gotten. Otherwise they're going to leave. Right. But the goal is like, and I told, I told the YouTube rep this, like I'm not taking away anything from the people that already got me here. So I need to think of things that are like extra that I can give them. That's not an insane amount of work. And they're like, yeah, we get that. Cause he kept bringing up ideas where it was basically like, well, you could make it so the chat is members only. And I'm like, yeah, but then all the other people that got me to here can't chat. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense at all. Right. And so, yeah, I'm purely trying to go like, what could I do a little bit more? Not so much. What could I take away? Like there's one of the ideas we had, and I'm not saying I'm going to do it yet, but in theory, we can let you guys members, we could let you guys have access to the video a day before it goes live. Like that's a little thing, right? Like it's like, okay, so yes, I have to wait till tomorrow to watch the video. Okay. Like that's not a big deal, but some people might value that, but I don't want to be like, that's why you should give me your $5. You can watch my stuff 24 hours sooner. Like that's not a good sales pitch. So I don't want to bring that stuff up, but I do want to figure out a system that would be fun. You know, maybe it's just crazy pictures I take or you know, I don't know what it is. That's the thing. That's why I don't put a big sales pitch on it because I want you guys to like, I don't know, I guess donate five bucks and have fun with other people and like hopefully get that as a rewarding experience. And then I do stuff that makes it more fun. I don't want it to be like paid $5 for this hamburger and it tastes terrible. Like that's, well, I'm not, I'm not really trying to sell that thing. I'm trying to like, as so like in a perfect world, maybe, Maybe if we had like a thousand members, I could be like, guess what, Fluval? I got a thousand members. Do you want to hand your brand new food out to all thousand of them? Like, and let's give them a code or like, that's how I could see that working. Maybe, maybe, you know, like, okay, guys, I got a thousand members. Here's what I want. I want you to give me a code. They can order for free off my website with any other purchase. And you guys are going to cover that. Like, that'd be a great thing, but we can only do that with big numbers. Cause if I'm like, Hey, I got, I got 14 people that are uh, willing to listen to me. So let's hook that up, you know? Yeah, so we'll see. We'll see where it leads. That's the thing. I, I don't know where it's going to lead. Hopefully it leads somewhere super cool. And I don't know what we could do. You know, maybe I'll do an extra like, no, see, I already, I was like, maybe I'll do an extra live stream somewhere. But I'm like, I don't really want to hold that back from you guys. Ooh, I could think of someone was at, I can think of a thing. I could think of a thing maybe. I can think of a thing. Okay. Someone was asking me, why don't I do like master breeder series? And my answer was because they don't do well on YouTube. Like if I get the foremost expert on how to breed mollies, it's not going to do well. But 
I could publish it as an unlisted video, so that won't hurt the channel. But then, like right now, you guys, the only way you'd ever know when I publish an unlisted video, which I have before, you'd have to go back and look at my old videos and be like, hey, I didn't see that one because they don't send out notifications for that. But I can put that on the community members page. I could be like, look, I made a new video that's unlisted. So everyone that's currently a, a member would see that notification, but everyone that's not a member could also have access to it. So I wouldn't be limiting you. It would be YouTube just not notifying you. So that might be one of those corner cases. Now, I don't want you guys all signing up going, well, you said you were doing Master Beater Series, so I signed up and now you didn't do it. I'm just saying that's a new line of thinking that maybe I can supply something that didn't make sense before, but now quasi makes sense. I also don't want to wrap myself up into, you said you were making six member only videos a week. Why aren't you doing it? So, you know. Time for a kiss. Just got a 30 gallon. 100% bear tank. Plan on getting three goldfish. Storekeeper recommended a sponge filter and a hang on back for more bio filter. Do I agree? I don't think it's a bad plan. Uh, the one thing I would point out is a hang on back, depending on the type of goldfish. You could like get eyeballs sucked into the intake of that. Like, and sometimes the flow is pretty strong. Like if you're going fancy goldfish, you don't want super strong flow. If you're doing commons, one, you probably want a bigger tank, but like they can handle that strong flow. I might say you're better off with two sponge filters or maybe a sponge filter and like a, like a Zis filter. Like that's, I'd be tempted to run something like that. You know, shameless plug. I sell that thing. So obviously I'd be making money if you bought it. So keep that in mind that the salesman is telling you this is what I would do. Um, but no, like an aqua clear filter, hang on back, perfectly usable. I would get an intake sponge if I was running that though. Um, but I, I do feel like if I was setting up a tank for goldfish, I would go with like two sponge filters or one in one like that Zis filter. That's what I think I would do in that scenario. That's just me though. There are definitely lots of new members. Let me see if I can run through. And I know I missed a bunch of super chats. Not that I'm going to answer them all. We established that already. Oh, my thing's broken. It doesn't even show me all the new members. Hold on, let's see if I refresh. Everything got messed up when I... Oh, whoa. Okay, there we go. So we got... Christine Lucas, Crystal Shack Aquatics, Uber, Trigger, Happy, Michael Sloan, Fabian Rays, Tetra Guy, Texas. Ooh, hopefully you're, I'm going to see you in Texas. Um, I missed this one. Mariah Stevens got a 75 gallon tank, which is a tall one, 25 inches or 21 inches tall, and wanted to do a planet tank. Anubias and swords and vowels, community tank. What fish would you recommend? The $5 for the tacos. Uh, I would tell you, like, if I was setting that tank up, buy yourself 100 Neon Tetras. You won't regret it. They always look good. Always. Like, we have a tank at the store like that. Everyone's like, whoa, that tank looks awesome. Like, that's what 100 Neon Tetras looks like. Looks awesome, right? Like, it's the easiest buy this will look cool move. Like, it just always looks good. So that's, that's the move. Uh, Scott Wilkerson says, isn't there an alternative that's a g as good or better than the mag float that you might be able to source a better price? Uh, that's a good, that's a good question. Let me, let me go grab something. I'll be right back. So as part of my job, it is my job to make sure I'm getting you guys the best deal. We're making money, doing all that kind of stuff. So we have researched other companies. Now, a lot of the companies, they don't have. So what's special about the mag float? This, the part on the inside floats, right? So a lot of the magnets is just two magnets. If you break the connection, it falls to the ground. Now, one of the most dangerous things is when it falls to the ground, it picks up any gravel or grit and you put that back up there, it's going to scratch your tank. With the mag floats, it floats up to the top and is usually easier to get back onto the glass, right? So I consider that to be one of the fundamental needs to be happening properties to limit the risk of damaging an aquarium. So then we go like, okay, this one claims to be floating too. It's the Oase one. And then you're like, man, 
that looks like a, a mag float, right? Well, let's see if I can focus this in on here. Oh, can I focus? Right there. You look real close. What does that say? It says mag float. So literally, they're just stamping Waze on here, and it is a mag float. So then we know, like, I should just go with the mag float because they're going to charge me more than I can get with the mag float. So our research pointed us towards mag float was the cheapest if we could buy at an insanely high rate. So we did. So the pro here's here's our commitment, right? That whole like, why don't you pay yourself more money? That type of thing. We're investing in the future. So I think last year we sold like 37 mag floats the entire year, like 37. Cause we're high priced, right? Like you guys are like, I'm willing to give Corey the money. I respect what he does. I'm gonna invest in Corey. We sold like 37 of those things. We just bought $5,000 worth, which is all way, way, way more than 37 of those. But we were able to drop the price down by quite a bit. So now the theory is like, hopefully we're gonna sell 370 of these things, which we'd still have inventory left over, but we'd sell a lot more at a lower price. And that money I invested there gives us another product that's kind of moving and helping us, right? So that that's the goal. Now, by all means, if you are a magnet manufacturer and you have a great product and you want to sell it to me wicked cheap so I can sell it to my people wicked cheap, let's talk. I'm all I'm all open. That being said, I got to move a lot of these mag floats cuz I'm 5 grand deep in these things. But after that, I am all ears to make that happen. And yeah, so we definitely do shop around. It's not like I'm just like, hmm, give me $10,000 of that and give me a better deal. Like, obviously I weigh all their competitors and I look around and we're, we're evaluating this as a team, by the way. So it's like, I ask my team members, do you know of anything? Have you seen one that you really like? Have you seen one? Have you seen one? No, I don't know. You know, so we, we definitely are trying. What filter is best for a single flower horn? I think like an AquaClear 110 is what I would use. Uh, we've got some new members from Christine, uh, Smikey Hunter Aquarium Games. We've got uh, Rob Mace. Uh, ooh, Justin Guberman. I hope you become a member, Justin Guberman. Like I would rather have $15 and you become a member than just $20. But I had a question about mixed fancy guppies what can I expect when they start breeding? A muddled mess, solid colors, etc.? You can expect all of that. Yes, it's going to be a kaleidoscope of color when that's what makes it so cool. You can get stuff that like, oh, that looks wild. Like, when I say wild, I mean like pretty drab and not a lot of color. You can get stuff that's going to have big tails, small tails, round tail, pin tail. You can get all the variants coming out of these things. And like even what you see at first, it'll be different than what you see in three years. Like it's going to morph and change as you keep them. So that's one of the one of my favorite things about a fancy guppy mixed tank is like what you see today is not what you're going to see in two years. So it's kind of one of those, it's always evolving. You'll find your favorites. You're like, hope that male breeds with all those ladies because I want more of him. Hope he's getting to it. Yeah. Catherine Van Epps has joined the team. H. Coit Luderman. I'm massacring names left and right. No apologies given. I'm just horrible at it. Uh, Megan Ness, will I sell tissue cultures? I trust you and can't find them in the area, or do you know of any companies that carry good tissue culture? So this, someone asked me this in the chat earlier. To the best of my knowledge, and this is just my knowledge, I don't know of anyone selling fresh tissue cultures all the time. Now, if you say, why don't you sell them, Corey? One, most of the public doesn't know how to plant them. Two, they're not profitable. What I mean by that is, when you see one that's $12.99, I had to pay $9.99 for it. And then I had to ship it to you. So I actually probably lost money. So there's that problem, right? And then there's a shelf life problem of like, well, after three weeks, you're kind of just supposed to clear it somewhere, throw them away. And so that's a problem. And then there's the extra problem of all the cool stuff you want, like uh, Anubius Panglio, um, uh, pink flamingo let's say ug let's what else is high on the demand list uh anubius marble or white i have to buy 15 other plants so things like uh alternanthari renekii and that kind of stuff and just other crypts is tissue culture for every one of those i can buy and it's not like i buy 15 of those and i get one pink flamingo and a panglio and 
the Nubius White, I get to choose one of those. So it's a 15 to one thing. And then on top of that, you're just wanting the one thing. So I end up having all these plants that kind of go stale. So until we can figure that out, we need to bring the cost down. We need to get public awareness up. And that kind of goes hand in hand, right? If they get cheaper, more people are going to learn about them, right? So we kind of need it to come from both sides and be like, oh, the sweet spot, there it is. Now we can do it. Now, aquascapers, very in tune with it. The problem is aquascapers make up about 5% of plant buyers. So there's that. We got to get around that thing. So when the time makes sense, and we've, here's the thing. Tissue culture plants have been in the hobby for 10 plus years. I remember them being pitched to my store, not well, the store I, I managed, 10 plus years ago. And they didn't work then. And here we are 10 years later. Still don't really work for us. So until we get that figured out, it's a no-win for everyone involved. The labs, the stores, the end consumer customer. And here's how I know it's not working. When you walk into the ADA shops and stuff like that, you see this giant table of clearance tissue culture plants no one's buying. Then you see this other table. It's just like not quite bad enough to be on the other table yet. And there's not uh, a pink flamingo or any cool plant in sight. Like, oh, the day came, those came in, they were sold at too much money. And uh, yeah, went out the door the same day. All right. I'm going to take a break for the Super Chats. I'm going to go back to the main chat because my goal is not spend too much time on super chatters only. And I want to try to remain true to that fact. So what are my thoughts on a bumblebee catfish? Ask stud fishing. I think they're kind of cool. They come in like that super small variety. And then there's like the Asian bumblebee that's like, boom, pretty big. They look cool. Some of them are a little bit predatory at night, but they're a relatively cool fish. So I think they're kind of cool. Oh no. Corey, are you going to get a taller ladder instead of standing dangerously on a short ladder when you go to feed those archers? Uh, if I'm being honest, no, I won't. Because I so rarely would do that move. So why did I do that move? Because um, the other ladder was out of the way? Why Why did I get on that one? I think, oh, because we needed... We needed me to place the Sarah Ovna tabs and have a good shot for the cameras we had set up. If I put the big ladder in front right there, the shot's ruined. You move that big ladder, everyone goes freaking out. And so rarely would I ever have to do that move. So the answer is I own taller ladders, but that's the ladder we needed to use to get the shot. So yeah. Okie dokie. Maybe get Tropica to use Coop as a US distributor. Well, so Tropica, if we're if I'm being transparent, yes, I had a meeting with them when I was in Germany about that. Yes, I've gotten Tropica plants to my store. Now, without talking bad about a company, do the math. Wait, Corey, you don't sell Tropica plants on your website. Hmm, interesting. But Corey. The Tropica Farm is an hour and a half from your store. Why wouldn't you buy from them? Hmm. Interesting. But no, I don't sell Tropica plants. So maybe there's something going on there. And I don't want to say why. But all I can say is I have very high standards when it comes to plants and stuff like that. And so far, it has not made sense for me to carry Tropica plants. That could change tomorrow. Although, the minute they hear this, that's never going to happen. Uh, but yes, so I, I evaluate every source I can to bring you guys the best stuff in every category so much so that I started that train over a year ago and I was like, yes, it totally makes sense. I'm in your guys' backyard. We should blow up the U S with Tropica plants. And then here I am not doing that. And there's a reason why. And it's just, it, it not up to snuff with what I want to do pricing's not correct there's all these things like the the biggest non-starter for me was this and you know i'm not afraid to say this because this is a hundred percent fact it's not opinion i ordered plants and even though you could drive from my store to their farm let's say for traffic three hours it took five days to get to my warehouse and in my opinion i only buy plants that take 24 hours or less on a plane to get to me. 
Like, I want the plants in the box the least amount of time so they are as fresh and as good as possible when they hit my water to start converting them. And so, if something two hours away or three hours away takes five days to get to you, that is not nearly as good as 24 hours. On top of that, I paid more money to get them slower and the plants cost me more. So it's like, it's kind of losing on every level and it might totally work out in like a year or two years. I don't know. Like maybe they got to scale up their production. Prices drop a little bit. Also, because they're just offering plants, their selection is very narrow. So like on the average, maybe I've got a hundred species. I had like 20 to choose from. So yeah, that's the reason we haven't like teamed up because I, I can't fulfill what I needed to do yet, I guess. That's the best answer I got. Uh, let's see. Any places that sell spray bars? Hmm. It used to be a thing. Fluball used to sell them, like in a kit, and you could adapt to anything, and they got rid of it. So I want to do a video on making a spray bar, because I, I want to make one for the pond, and I'll probably teach you guys how to do it, because I used to make them all the time for FX6s. I've done it for FX4. And like, it's not hard to do out of PVC. And in fact, if you buy like the gray PVC, the electrical conduit looks pretty good. Don't even really have to paint it. Um, so yeah, I don't know of anyone selling great spray bars that are like easy to adapt to most things. A lot of, they used, to, spray bars were all the rage like nine years ago, eight years ago. Everyone's like, oh, you don't have a spray bar? No wonder your fish don't love you. At the same time where if you didn't own a arena, XP filter, you were uh, just a goblin. You're like, don't look at that guy. He doesn't need an arena. Oh, what a, what a guy. What a guy. In my opinion, how fast would, val would the Val plant grow in a low light tank? That's really like speculative. How low a light? How much nutrients? Are we injecting CO2 but still have low light? In my experience, though, it is my favorite plant. If you were only going to do one, just do Valisneria. It's great, looks good, super tolerant. Once you get it going, it loves you, you know, learns your name, sings to you nightly. It does all the things you want it to do. So, all right. Um, let me hop back over here. We got Cordy Boy Aquatics became a member. Dylan Zermino. Why is feeding floating food bad for goldfish? But feeding them duckweed is good. Seen many of your videos, and you said duckweed is best for the goldfish. So, I do want to be very clear that in my videos, you won't have seen me saying floating food is bad for goldfish. You may have seen me saying other people say that, but I don't believe that. I believe that, essentially, I'm going to take this into super hyperbole here. Three goldfish ever have gotten, let's say, swim bladder issues from eating off the top. And those people that own those fish were so good at convincing other people that that is the absolute death sentence for goldfish that it became this giant internet meme that everyone is terrified to feed a floating food. That being said, wait, what? We feed all of our koi, we feed all of our goldfish and stuff like that in ponds floating food and we never have problems. What? Well, aquariums are magical and things happen. No, I think we're just hypersensitive to it because we believe the internet things. And in my opinion... Fish get into trouble when you overfeed them food, right? And I've, I've talked about swim bladder in other videos and that kind of stuff. That is the root of the problem. Not that they ate it off the top. Ooh, they ate a bubble. Things are going to happen. It's quality of food. It's protein amounts. It's all these other outside factors. But, you know, I, I hang out in the goldfish groups, and I've said it before, like, we – we tend to go to what's easiest and like everyone's saying the thing. It's way easier to be the guy that agrees with everyone than the one guy in the room that says, no, that's not how that works. And everyone goes, yes, it is. So we tend to be agreeers as opposed to critical thinkers that want to change the common opinion. So I'm of the opinion that uh, the floating food is not the source. It is just a coincidence. But yeah. Because in, okay, let me back that up. In general, someone that would be overfeeding or possibly having bad water quality would be using cheaper foods. And in general, cheaper foods float because the more proteins you put into food, the heavier they are and they sink. So in general, if you had someone feeding Wardley pellets, 
low quality flake foods, Cheerios, all this stuff is done for goldfish. And maybe they're letting their water quality go on top of that. You could, you could, from an outside standpoint, you can go, oh, the floating food is causing issues. But the reality is if you took a very high quality food and you kept water really good and you did all these other things, I don't notice any difference at all with swim bladder issues. In fact, it is so rare for me to have a swim bladder issue because in general, we feed duckweed. We feed high fiber foods like um, frozen brine shrimp and things like that so that their digestional system is moving very quickly. So like those are more important than any one right food or anything like that. Like understanding how that animal kind of works. And also knowing that like, you know, how many people say like, oh, gravel kills goldfish. I don't think gravel kills goldfish any more than gravel kills dogs. My dogs could go eat gravel. Goldfish are always picking up and spitting it back out. Yes, that's true. Well, what if it was super sharp? Like, yeah, what if my dog was chewing on razor blades? That's not good. But I, you know, like that's not the case. Like you, all rocks aren't instantly bad just because some are sharp. Maybe we should avoid rocks like conga rock that's been uh, surrounded in epoxy that's going to flake off after time and there's dyes in it. Maybe we should avoid the sharp rocks that are the cheapest ones that are dye that come from stores that sell, you know, clown puke gravel. Like those are extremes. But when you get to the point like, well, how come all goldfish that come from the, you know, carp aren't just dying in the wild and they're an epidemic like in the waterways and they get released? Like shouldn't, shouldn't uh, gravel just be taking them out like snipers left and right? Well, no, because not all rocks do that. It's in confined environments where maybe we're feeding food that gets down in there and they're forced to really dig at it and then it's a sharp one or it's an epoxy coated one like there's all these external factors and in my opinion i myself have only ever seen one goldfish in person that had a lodged rock now i'm a guy that might have seen hundred thousand goldfish so maybe it turns out that goldfish is just really dumb and not that all rocks are the number one goldfish killer right kind of the same thing with oxalotls and that kind of stuff like oxalotls if they swallow rock they could die their digestion is also made to pass those things though same thing with a mubu puffer if it swallows a clam it can get impacted and die it's also designed by nature to do that so while maybe one out of ten thousand dies to clam impaction the thing is literally built to eat clams right so, but we, no one wants to lose their pet. And when you do, you got to make sure everyone knows, don't let puffers eat clams. It killed my puffer. It's the number one puffer killer. And if I can tell a good story, you believe me. So, what are my top five most profitable fish? If we're talking in the store, that would be Otto Sinkless, Neon Tetras, Cardinal Tetras, Rummy Nose Tetras. I don't know if I know the fifth right off the top of my head. It might be something obscure like a German blue ram. Could also just be like a black neon tetra though, but tetras in general. People buy them in big groups. Uh, love my wet pets, became a member, and Gerson became a member too. Not and, but and. Watch one of your YouTube videos where you feed your tanks and point at some planaria and say they're not competing uh, shrimp. The planarian, aren't planaria bad for shrimp? Here's my question, Oliver. I don't know. Have you ever done a test on if they're bad? Because in my experience, keeping hundreds of tanks for years and years and years, I have never once seen an impact on my shrimp colony where there has been planaria. So from my testing, no. I have never seen a correlation between planaria being present and me having any problems with shrimp. Right? So if your question is, doesn't the entire internet say that planaria kill shrimp? Then I could be like, well, yes. Yes, they do. They also claim that one assassin snail and shrimp, oh, man, it's like we're having a cocktail shrimp party. It's going to be a bloodbath. And yet I bred them in the same tank for profit for many years. What? No, you did not. That didn't happen. Cool, except it's on video and I did it. So, yes, it does do that. Kind of that's the corner case scenario. So, but in general, let's think about where we see planaria. Planaria in general happen in an environment where there's not predators, which usually means not many, many fish, which we typically don't have a lot of fish in a, in a shrimp tank. And then typically they thrive where there's lots of leftover food. 
oh, in a shrimp tank where we feed shrimp way too much food. Instead of feeding them things like bacteria and that kind of stuff, we feed them sticks of food because we kill pets with food. I love, oh, I love you. Here, have more. Oh, you'll do better. You'll look better. You'll make more babies. I'll give you more food, right? And then naturally in that aquarium, we don't want to gravel vac that thing. We could suck up some babies. So then we're neglecting maintenance. So we're creating this perfect storm to make sure these shrimp live that also is the perfect storm to make sure planaria live. So we could just not make it the perfect storm and like, oh, let me keep some fish and, and shrimp together. You can't do that. Even though I, I do that a bunch, proven that, that works, blah, blah, blah. But yes, if I keep guppies and shrimp and I breed both, typically I never have any planaria in there because they just eat it. Um, vice versa, maybe you got an auto feeder feeding way too much or maybe you're out of town and someone else feeding too much and you temporarily get an explosion in planaria population. That's not instantly going to kill your shrimp. Uh, it will probably recede if you go back to normal feeding. And in general, it's kind of like a snail population. I've got a billion snails, snails of the devil. Actually, you're just, you have way too much food for snails and that's why you have a billion snails. Fix that, which is the actual problem, and you won't have a snail problem. Kind of the same thing. Ooh, I noticed I got a few planarian in this tank. Hmm, I better cut back the food a little bit, probably in a couple weeks. I won't have planaria anymore, or I'll have so few I don't even see them. The reality is planaria in a tank are beneficial. They help part of the ecosystem. They're going to break stuff down. We just don't want anything in an aquarium ever in excess, really. We don't want excess ammonia. We don't want excess nitrite. We don't want extra, excess nitrate. We don't want excess CO2. We don't even want excess uh, oxygen. Like anything in too much excess is detrimental. So that's one of those scenarios. Well, the internet tells everyone it's bad, so therefore it must be bad. In my own personal experience, I have not witnessed it being bad. So there you go. That's my honest answer to that planarian question. And that's why I didn't delve into that because it's like, that would have made your 10 minute video like 20 minutes long. And if you weren't into listening about planaria right there, you just left. So, and it'd be better to do a whole video on planaria and be like, here's all the things. Here's the correct dosage of flubendazole that I know kills planaria. By the way, it also kills your snails, but doesn't kill your shrimp. There's all these things that go into it. Don't listen to me. It's going to kill everything. I don't want to be liable for it. You know. Yes. Ooh, this question is going to tie right in. First, we have William Ganey becoming a member. Thank you very much, buddy. Can you over-fertilize your aquarium? So from the previous statement, anything in excess is detrimental. Specifically with Easy Green, I have a 60 gallon tank showing deficiencies. How much should I increase my fertilization? So, with Easy Green specifically, I'm very well versed in this product. My advice is to keep 20 parts per million of nitrate in your aquarium at all times if we can assume that the nitrogen that's in there is from Easy Green. So, what that means is if you weren't dosing Easy Green and you're, you're nitrates are at 40 parts per million that doesn't mean just keep it at 20 that means okay well we need to get it down to like zero then we'll dose easy green until we have 20 parts per million and then if the plants eat that in two days we need to redose right so the goal is always having 20 parts per million <clears throat> easy green while knowing that's the source and not letting it run out so a deficiency shows you that you're missing something now it could be that you're missing phosphorus, right? Or phosphates. In general, the ratios of easy green, when we dose nitrogen, it's going to have enough phosphate in there. We're, we've designed it to do that. Now, every once in a while in a weird system, you might have well water that's got phosphate through the roof. And by dosing easy green, you might be having too much phosphate that could lead to excess algae. Now, Easy Green is not like the miracle where it's going to work for everyone 100% of the time. Always, it's designed to work for like 90% of the people. And there's going to be 10% where are like, well, this doesn't work for my water. Like, yes, I can't design a product that will absolutely work in every situation ever. Like, we run into people that have nitrates in their well or ammonia in their well or all these things. And it's like, well, this is designed for majority of the people that have tap water that has like none of that stuff in it and this is going to work really well for them and then like kind of crappy for you but you've got kind of that the root of the problem thing we go back to that scenario of like well the root of the problem is you kind of already have poor tap water let's fix that maybe or you can go the other route and go oh i'm going to ei dose or i'm going to make my own fertilizer to combat what i've got going on 
in my own water. And that's what I would do. Honestly, if that was me and I knew like I'm never moving, I bought this house, I'm always going to have X in my water, I would become an expert in that uh, field and go, okay, I make my own fertilizer and it works out really good now. You know, like I would just, I would adapt my hobby to it instead of, you know, the other way around. That's what I would do. All right, I'm going to hop back to normal chat because we've been on Super Chat ranting too long, too long. Uh, let's see here. From Josh, any advice on what aquarium lighting I should use? We've kind of got a hidden lighting page at the moment. If you go to like the Fluval 3.0, there should be a link that says like, help choosing my light. Go there, it gives all the light recommendations I have for the size of the tank and if it's low light, medium light, or high light. So of the lights we sell, obviously, like it's not just a list of like, here's 7,000 lights in every scenario. Of the lights we sell, it really helps you dial in and it gets you like, oh, am I trying to get to low to medium light or am I trying to get to medium to high light? And it goes all the way from, I think five gallons, maybe even two and a half, all the way up to 210 gallons. And so like on a 210, you're using uh, four 36 inch lights. That'll give you like medium to medium high if you're using flu ball lights. If you're using four of those at like a Stingray, give you low light. If you're using just two 36 inch flu lights, you'd be at a low light also. So like it, it gives you almost every spread there and uh, cause I've done almost every tank size at this point. I can kind of give you like, here's what I liked. Here's what I noticed. Here's what you should get roughly. Okie dokie. Leeches in my tank from black worms. Any advice? I know there's some plecos that will eat them, but I don't know. Like maybe a copper, like you could maybe try cooper mine that might kill it, but also know it'll kill the black worms and know that if you're successful in killing off the leeches, it'll probably kill off the black worms and any snails you had, and you could lead yourself to an ammonia spike. So just know that like that process is going to lead you down a path of like, oh geez, I'm running into ammonia and all that kind of stuff. So, ooh, it's going. This what people asked what this was. This is the count of how many uh, Facebook subscribers or fans or what do they call those? Fans? Facebook friends? I don't know. Whatever they call it, that's what we have. How do planaria and detritus uh, start up though? That's what I've always wondered. Well, detritus, maybe you're thinking detritus worms, which that's kind of the same thing. Well, there's some other worms, but in general, they can come in from uh, fish poop. Like you, you're, you bring fish in, you just bring it. They could come in with very small worms off of plants. Like anytime we add something to an aquarium, we have the possibility of introducing something. Even frozen foods, that's why it says on the package, 99.8% sterile because there's 0.02% that's not sterile that we could introduce things into that aquarium even though it's been frozen. There are things that can live through the freezing process, the flash freeze. So in general, we get it by just um, bringing stuff in. Like there's no real way. And they're like, sometimes you would swear that like, there's no way I put that in there. And yet it just develops. So like I watch it happen uh outside a lot like oh i got red worms in here i wonder how that got started yeah david gilkinson says no leg on the wi-fi i think you nailed the problem check for an update driver on the motherboard replace the motherboard or you can get a dedicated internal network card yes this was attempt number one was a dedicated card but i didn't have a free i think it's pcie four slot and i did update the bios already when i was having a problem a couple months ago it is intermittent and I haven't been able to nail it down, but I do think that by running this test and going to Wi-Fi, we have figured out that it's probably that Ethernet connection. And thus, if I get uh, an Ethernet dedicated card to a slot I have open, in theory, should fix it. Let's hope. Because I don't want to repeat next week and be like, one of these days, I'll get my act together. <laughs> Tune in next week. Maybe I don't run a train wreck. All right, what's my wife saying? Oh, at 6.15, I lagged for a second. I could believe I would lag for a millisecond here because I'm on uh, a Wi-Fi connection. Even though, like, let's think. My computer, yeah, the router and the computer is a foot and a half away. But just in general, you can't run as fast a connection, and we're running a very demanding connection right here. So, yeah. 
Uh, the fish, t the fish tank barn says there is an old internet wise tale that says copper will forever limit your tank. I believe that it eventually gases off pi uh, pipes are copper. What's my opinion? Uh, I, I would love to run that test actually. Um, so in theory, I want so like if I was going to run that test, here's the things I need to know: how much copper is lethal? I don't know that off the top of my head. Two. Can I test copper with a TDS meter? Don't know. But if I can, that'll help. Three, could I dose copper into a tank and then change water a bunch and then use, like we have a copper test kit. Will that be sensitive enough? Will the kit be sensitive enough to know if we have residual? And is that amount enough to be killer? And how long would it take to, let's say, get out of silicone? and will it go into acrylic like there's all these things like it's really easy to be like i dose cooper mine i change 50 percent of the water i change 50 percent of the water i change 50 percent of the water over the course of two months and then i put snails in and they all died well to me my story goes like yeah you took out 50 percent of the copper filled it back up took out 50 percent of that copper filled it back up took out 50 percent of that copper filled it back up you're still left with like one eighth the amount of copper which might have been lethal so then, but then you would say like, yeah, it, no matter how long you go, it's always, once copper hits the tank, it's always lethal. Like that could be true. It also might not be true. So you'd have to run a lot of testing and I'm not saying I would never do it, but it's not on like the, Ooh, it's on the top 10 list. Nail that out, Corey. Let's put this internet rumor to bed. Um, but that is something I would love to know if someone did all that testing, I would love to report on it and be like, Oh cool. Someone did all the work. Now we know, Hmm, that's a thing. Or it isn't a thing. Yeah. So I'm hoping, so I've got this new series I'm working on. I want to do like internet versus the scientist. So what I want to do is like call up Seachem or Fritz or Sarah or Hikari, like a company, right? That has labs. And then I want to be like, I'm going here, guys. What questions do we have about their products? Do we really want to ask them? You know, like the first one I want to be like, is liquid gravel vac complete bs like where is the actual practicality where is the studies you've done like i don't want the science textbook that says well in theory this works i want to know like where do you actually run the test where do you see the improvement where do you see this thing work and ask them all the questions we can ask like uh is it shelf stable when it's in a warehouse in the middle of kentucky is it going to freeze to death when we ship it is it okay at 80 degrees in a fish store how long is the actual shelf life? Like all these things that someone that actually knows and will just give it to us straight. Like, I, so I, like I would love to know like copper, does it like, can it get stuck in silicone? And then they might go all nerd on us and be like, well, no, the silicone properties mean that we can never do that and never bond on molecular level. And it's actually known that silicone repelled this and blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, turns out we got scienced, you know, like, but I want to kind of start that series. I don't know if it'll do well, but I think, if I had like three scientists sitting there, you know, and like five out of four dentists agree that copper doesn't adhere to silicone and stay in a tank, we might be able to put that internet rumor to, to rest, right? It all matters if I can find that many dentists, though. All right. Um, copper and chromium uptake by duckweed. If, Find a scientific study and use the search term. Okay. If I have time, I might consider that. Uh, the amount of copper required to be lethal is depending on the species. That's definitely true. I would, oh, and their health and age, probably so. I would, I would settle for what is average, right? So like on average, this won't kill everything. But if you had like crazy sick old abba knives oh it's gonna kill them right off the get-go you know but like oh the average person runs a planet aquarium don't even worry about it like oh you got some reasonable fish you know i i definitely believe there's all those factors and that's the thing when you try and prove something someone can be like well, what about all these other factors you didn't factor in like yeah didn't take 26 years to prove all those wrong this only just proves it wrong for 90 percent of people that's all I'm willing to do. So I think that's part of part of the problem. Yeah. 
What's my favorite dog breed excluding Chihuahuas? Ooh, this is an important question. I have a soft spot for any old dog. I do love big dogs. I typically fall in love with pit bulls and stuff like that because they're just big and cuddly. I have a, a strange obsession with wanting to get a corgi or a lowrider dog as I call them. But in general, like a moth to a light is Cory to a dog. Like, hey, how are you doing? Like, I could see myself loving any dog. Uh, mostly I just love ones that aren't hyper aggressive, which I realize that's, you're like, chihuahuas will gnaw your arm off. No, they'll gnaw your arm off. They will love me. Like, they're very affectionate with their owners. Um, but, like, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to ever have a dog that was, like, aggressive towards me like not that anyone wants that dog but let's say it was like it has had some issue where it's like oh don't look at it wrong it'll bite your face off you know like i want a pet that wants to you know well let's just let's just go to sleep type of deal i can only express it with uh cartoon character voices you, do i think lower quality foods such as tetra flakes result in higher nitrate and less mass than something like omega-1 flakes i'm actually running an experiment for my bio class on this uh so i'd love to see the results of this jonah my educated opinion and i say educated in my own um my own mind right i would wager that there's very little difference being that probably the amount of protein we can utilize and the way f like flake foods are made up you're gonna get roughly the same utilization out of both those foods. There might be a little bit difference there, but I would I would see. And here's the problem: is it actually that one is a lower quality, or did one have slightly better palatability? Like you'd have to know that they were equally palatable, because you could do the same test. Like, well, let's see which one's better: the perfectly formulated chicken with salad and other fruits and vegetables in this thing or this cheeseburger. And if you give me the option, I just eat the cheeseburger every time, right? Like, or if I'm willing to eat twice as much cheeseburger as I am salad, then you skew to like, well, clearly cheeseburgers are higher quality. When the reality is like, well, no, they just taste way better. So that you can get those like the scientific like analysis, like, well, it's really hard to, to do like if you can get it so they you weigh it in let's say you're feeding two grams a day to one fish and each of them will consume two grams and then you can weigh the fish after x amount of time and figure out um actual growth but then you've got things like well did one grow better than the other one just because that was its genes and you've got all these weird things but on a on a super like i'm an aquarist would like to know the difference thing i think that's a decent study of like we're gonna put some food over here and some food over here and then you get to say, in my experience, there was no difference, or there was a massive difference, or very little difference. Like, that's enough to be like, yeah, that's a thing I saw. I didn't run it 100 times, you know. But if you saw that same trend 10 years in a row with 10 different types of fish, with 10 different classrooms, at 10 years, you'd be like, yeah, I really stand behind A or B because I've run it this many times. But the chances are what I think you would do if you had that situation, you'd be like A and B. So you'd be like Tetra versus Omega. And let's say Omega wins or Tetra wins. doesn't matter. Then year two, you'd be like, all right, it's winner versus this new food. And you'd keep doing that gauntlet until you'd be like, after 10 years, turns out this is the best food I found, right? So, but you'd have a lot of room for like, well, it's not the most scientific thing going on there. And I, I do believe most foods that are on the market right now are high quality so even low quality is still high quality like i think we're debating a few percentage points at best at this point just from evolution of the hobby that's my own personal opinion on that so all right hmm trying to find my chat my chance Hmm. Advice on calculating how much K1 micro is needed per fish? I don't know that answer, Michael. I would, if I was going to run that study, 
I would have a control aquarium with no substrate or anything like that. It would just be bare glass and then a reactor. And then I would figure out how much, let's say, one liter of media could process in raw ammonia. And then I could try and quantify how much, let's say, a neon tetra would produce in ammonia, in which case that would um, that would give you a roundabout way, but it's going to be really hard. Like, I'm not sure you can quantify each two-inch fish how much urea and ammonia and load are they having individually. So it'd be really hard to do that, I think. But that's the way you would you would attempt it, I think, is you get kind of a ballpark going and going, okay, if it can handle like eight parts per million ammonia, I'm dosing really hard, it can probably handle all this, and let me try to figure it out type of deal. All right. Um, a lot of new members. Thank you very much. Thanks for being the voice of reason amongst the fear-mongering and misinformation on the interwebs. So I'm not sure that people intentionally fear-monger. I think people are trying to be helpful, but the help is coming from advice that has worked for them. So for instance, in the previous test, if she does, jo if I'm a, I don't know if Jonah's male or female, that could go either way, but if Jonah, let's say it's a male, does a test and he figures out that Omega Flakes are better than Tetra, he, in good faith, will give that advice to someone else. Then that other person could say, I know a person that ran an experiment that proved that this flake food is better than that one. And if you tell a good story, more and more people will know that story. And so I don't believe any of that is fear-mongering. I believe that is everyone's trying to help each other based on the knowledge that they have. The problem is, if I've been in the hobby for 20 years, and I hear that, and I'm parroting that, and someone that's been in the hobby for 10 minutes hears that, they assume I've done a ton of research to come to that opinion. The reality is, I haven't. And so I think that's the breakdown, is that there's no qualifying or quantifying information. There's also regional differences, types of fish differences. Like what if we found out that with those flake foods, for instance, it makes a huge difference on tetras, but makes no difference at all on Oscars, or no difference at all on herbivore fish, or no difference at all at cold water fish. Like, you know, so a lot of stuff gets extrapolated based on common sense, so much so that we're not factoring in anything else. And so I think, yes, I don't think people are fear mongering. I do think I try to be the voice of reason of let's question everything and try to do some of our own testing and figuring things out for what works for us. But that's just me being skeptical and knowing that I'm all, of, like I get it, I'm all about fish. I love fish. Not everyone is like that. Probably most people in this chat aren't like that. Definitely most people in the hobby aren't like that. And so it's like, you know, for instance, I didn't spend 100 hours researching this Ethernet card. I used uh, a few Google websites and the reviews on Amazon. So I used a few hundred people's opinions, which would be the common internet fear mongering to let me know this would be a good NIC or network. What is it? Network interface card? Yeah, NIC. And so it's probably true. But if I did that for everything I ever did in life, there'd be a bunch of things that weren't true. You know, like, oh, well, Sonic's clearly the best fast food joint because that's what the internet says. Yeah, like you're going to be misguided sometimes. And I think we love to get all information easy and cheap. And then we love to hate on it when it's not right, easy, free, and cheap. Right? So I think, you know, we have to take, we have to factor in like, what'd you pay to get that information? Oh, it was free. Who'd it come from? That makes a difference. What were they keeping? That makes a difference. What was their motive? That makes a difference, right? Like sometimes you just like, I'm going to prove the internet wrong on everything today. Why? I got a lunch, and uh, I got nothing better to do. That's why. Okie dokie. Taco monies. Any plans to come down to San Diego? Not currently, fish keeperist. Nope, nothing bring me down. Uh, I was invited to a saltwater convention, but I don't plan on going yet. So, nothing yet. Ooh, Jonah with the follow-up. Do I think that a lower quality food... No, wait, I already read this. My bad, it's not a follow-up. I switched pages. 
Saw Pygmaeus Corey's ripping algae off driftwood. Uh, my thoughts. In general, I see a lot of fish eating algae. In the absence of like a buffet of their favorite foods, fish are forced to go into that mode of scavenger. So like if you don't feed angelfish for a week, they start being great algae eaters, for instance, right? Um, so yeah, I'm not shocked by that. In general, they're a scavenger type fish. And what you're probably seeing is they're eating the algae, but on that algae, there's copepods and microorganisms that they're actually eating as well. So they're getting that protein there and a byproduct that is like, yeah, I'm gonna swallow that algae. Cause it's, you know, it's kind of like all this spaghetti sauce with, with, uh, you know, ground beef in it is coming up with the, the noodles. Like I'm gonna eat the noodles because it's holding all the sauce in the ground beef. It's kind of just a byproduct of like, I want to eat that ground beef it tastes real good. And yeah, I'm willing to eat that noodles on the way because it's slowing me down. Otherwise, if I had to separate the two. Have I ever used black diamond blasting sand as substrate? I myself have not. I've used some black onyx and things like that, but I've never used what the hobbyists can, can, can my, word, my words can't work, my brain can't work. What hobbyists typically refer to as the diamond black blasting sand uh it's not available in our area so i don't have like that specific one and it could be made from a different type of slag or something like that so i tend to go like mm, i don't from what i researched on it, it doesn't seem like the best um the best substrate out there but it is cheap and a lot of people like the looks of it but i myself don't have experience with it so now we have a legitimate follow-up from jonah uh i'll super chat or email you the results when i find out of course just one faulty test uh, so it probably won't say much. I'm using goldfish, by the way. So yeah, I mean, most tests I run never actually quantify anything. All they do is get me one step closer to maybe knowing something. And you might go like, oh, I didn't realize any difference between the flake food at all, but I did notice that this happened. Like you might get like into a whole new thing where you're like, oh man, I'm totally checking out planaria now because yeah we were feeding heavy and now we got planaria and i learned a bunch about planaria so like where you start doesn't dictate where you're going to end i find that all the time like i start making a video and by the time i'm done the video is nothing to do with where i started it's like oh i found all this cool stuff going on so that's where i i like to let my learning and my experimenting take me where it wants to go because it can be very discouraging like i have to find the answer to this one thing and i can't find it any new plans for the musk turtles? Nothing currently. They're kind of just doing their thing. I need to like, I thought about setting up a different aquarium for them and using that for fish, but that, that like left after like an hour. I was like, yeah, it sounds like a lot of work. So yeah. All right. Um, well, we got a lot of deleted messages going on. So I would say uh, for all the mods in general, people can repeat questions if they're not like spamming it. Like we don't want it spammed every minute, but at the same time, like if you put it once and I don't see it, it'll never be seen. So maybe it's like, I don't know. It's a fine line. Like I don't want to put a time limit on like once every five minutes, but at the same time, like there definitely should be some serious space between like asking again it helps sometimes if you put the at at aquarium co-op i see it a little more but i also don't like if everyone's doing that it's not going to stand out anymore realize it's kind of a lottery thing there's obviously a thousand people asking questions and i can only answer them so fast so how many people do we have currently right now we have 1160 or at least that was the peak that we had before my internet crapped out all righty CO2 scares me a little bit. I love my little buggers. Yeah, you should be scared. But at the same time, so I find this ironic. People are super scared of having too much CO2, but no cares in the world that they have too little oxygen, right? Like you should be equally as scared of not having enough oxygen, yet everyone's like, well, I don't even worry about that. So, yeah. Oh, my wife's bringing in the, the, big, the big things. They're spamming at least a few times before I delete it and spam a couple more times then i put them on timeout i've warned them too i'll let it go for a while and i'll do it again if it's the same people yes don't defy my wife because i believe she only has everyone's best interests in heart so if my wife dorkula is 
timing you out or advising you to like, whoa, buddy, chill for a little bit. I believe her to be doing a good job because she's sat through probably 200 of these live streams. So if you're getting those warnings, know that typically I have way less patience and I would just like ban hammer you right away. So realize like that's a courtesy coming to you like, whoa, buddy, chill. We'll get to you when we can get to you. I apologize. A lot of people talking at once. We'll do what we can. All right? Cool. Let's hang out. And you can also be asking other people. So you don't have to like, um, you don't have to get my answer. There are plenty of people in this chat that are very, very, very well-versed aquarists, right? So they could answer the question just as well as I could. Well, not even just as well. There are people in this chat that know way more than I know about particular subjects. So don't be afraid to get, you know, we've got a thousand people in one room. I guarantee the collective knowledge of the 999 other people is way more than my knowledge. So, you know, you could, so instead of asking like, so like we've got a question right here, can you do a Seachem, Flourish, Advance, and Excel at the same time? And it's, it's, it's targeted towards me. You could say like, does anyone know? And I encourage all of you guys to answer each other's questions if you know the answer, right? Like that's what we're here for. So yes, you can do Seachem, Flourish, Advance, and Excel at the same time. I'm also using Seachem Trace. And I'm trying to make sure I don't overdo anything. I have to dose all the products at the moment. From what I hear is you're doing a bunch of work and probably not getting the results. Like half dosing and dosing all the traits. Like where are you getting all your macros? Like your nitrogen, potassium, phosphates, all that kind of stuff. Like you would want to be dosing those in addition to all those other ones. Or you're probably missing some. So... Uh, a way to measure dissolved oxygen on a budget. I believe you can buy like a $26 test kit on Amazon. Otherwise, it's like a $200 meter. But I believe, and I don't know the level of accuracy, just as I don't know the necessarily the level of accuracy on my dissolved oxygen meter because I don't have like five of them to choose from and then be like, oh, let me test them all. But what I do know is as long as, let's say it's 0.1 ppm off, as long as that's steady, and I measure all my aquariums and this one's five points off, I would know that like, yeah, it's either five points or 4.9 points off, but it's still way off. And I think you could do the same thing with that kit of like, so long as you don't need to know like optimum, what is optimum? Is it like 11? I'm trying to remember, seven? Average freshwater aquarium. When I was doing it, I knew. I think it was like seven parts per million. And so if you're way lower, but you wouldn't want to be like publishing a study and be like, it was this like, but if you just need to know like, where am I at roughly that would tell you. And I do think you can learn a lot. Like when you test a, a freshwater planet tank while the lights are on and then test it like right before the lights come on the next day, you'd be like, Whoa, it gets really low in oxygen. I found that out. There's a lot of things that I found out. You'd be like, that ain't true. Like, I mean, the meter doesn't lie though. Right. So yeah. Uh, let's see. What's a good camera to film on and is user friendly? Ask Rich. Um, so I think the most user friendly camera out there is your cell phone. And if you get a pretty good cell phone, it does a pretty good job. If you're moving towards a dedicated camera, um, I really like, I'm using a, a Fuji X-T3, which is a $2,000 camera, but it's got really nice microphone. It's got a lot of good features to it. Um, yeah, there's... A lot of people that are newer to the YouTube scene or maybe maybe not even a YouTuber, but maybe just want like a, a camera to take pictures and do stuff. The Canon M50 is a great camera. It's about $500, five to $600 these days, which, yes, that could be very expensive for a camera. Um, but without knowing a budget, it's hard to make a recommendation, you know, because I could be talking to someone that only wants to spend $20, someone that wants to spend $2,000. So obviously, for the most part, in life as we know the more money you spend hopefully the more benefit you get from it now as in everything there's like diminishing returns like a two million dollar camera might not be better than a twenty thousand dollar camera by that much right not proportionally versus like a twenty thousand dollar camera versus a two thousand dollar camera proportionally maybe not that much so yeah all righty i couldn't grow 
I couldn't get Val to grow with ferts and root tabs for like six months. Replace the Aquion light with a Fluval 3.0, and it's growing pretty good now. So yeah, when you grow plants, you're limited by the source that you're limited by. And for, let's say, 60% of people, that might be fertilizer. For 40% of people, it might be light. Like, those are the two main things. Light plus fertilizer and a plant equals growth. And, yeah, so it's kind of a process of elimination. Now, in general, those Aquion lights, they were just a cash grab by Aquion. Like, oh, get in cheap and keep adding bulbs. Like, we'll just nickel and dime you to death. Um, and at full capacity, they still were pretty weak on the, the light output. But... You know, they did get a lot of people into planet tanks, which is good. They are decent at making, like, I like the fact that you can make, like, a cichlid tank look good. You can make colors on fish look pretty good. They're they're pretty customizable, but they're not cheap. And at the fully loaded thing, um, it didn't do what it needed to do. Like, I would have been fine with it if it was, like, a two bulbs. Yeah, it's pretty cheap. You get to four bulbs, and, man, yeah, it's just as good as a Fluval 3.0. Like, that system I would probably be selling right now. I'd be like, yeah, let people step their way up to what they want to do. But the end goal was like, oh, it's just not that good still. Dang it. Am I going to add – am I getting more fish for the 800 gallon? I know I'm going to add uh, probably a ghost knife and probably a rainbow shark, and I don't know what else. Right now I'm on – like, right now there's meds in the water, and I'm on the – let me enjoy what's going on. Let me get some hardscape in there. Let me figure out what I want to do and slowly ease back into it. That's my goal right now. I want to like, the way the aquarium is right now is different than it was. Let's really enjoy that for a while. And then let's change it up a little bit and enjoy that. It's really easy. You guys have probably experienced this when you have an aquarium and you switch it up and you change all the things and it's the coolest thing for 30 days. And then you're like, well, I'm bored again. You know, so if we make that process take six months or a year, then I'm getting a year of enjoyment before I need to like mix it up, right? So when you're a guy that owns a fish store and can like just send it out an email and be like, hey, I need this stuff, send it. I can literally like change it and do all the things, but then you're like bored again. And I don't want to get to a point where it's like, you've done 72 different things this year with that tank. Like, yeah, it's been crazy, right? I get bored real easy. So I'd rather be like, oh, let me just, what do I want to do? Maybe something cool come into the fish store. Maybe I'll... Go visit someone and see something cool. Like, who knows? Don't know where it's taking me yet. Uh, am I... So this one says, Are you going to do a care guide on angelfish ever? Keep up the good work. Want to buy uh, Maltese shell dwellers online. Where would you buy? I would look on Aquabid. Uh, but as far as an angelfish guide, probably we'll do it at some point. But I kind of want to have, like, Dean do it. Because that's... Like, it's a guide that obviously I could do. Well, I shouldn't say obviously, but I'm confident I could do that guide. I'm also confident Dean could do that guide, and I think it would bring a level of um, freshness to that series, I guess. Like, why not get someone like Dean to do it? He's good on camera. People will enjoy it. So maybe I will, like, I'm going to Dean's. We're scheduled to go on Sunday to do some filming. Maybe that'll be one of the videos. I'll be like, hey, I want you to do a care guide. Just us, you, go. And we'll see how it comes out, right? So maybe we'll do that. Yeah. The reality is there's 4 billion videos to make. And there's only so much time to make them. And so kind of go, what am I going to do today? Hmm, I don't know. So. All right. Where are we at? We got about 15 minutes left. Um, I would love to see a breed clown launches. Me too. I don't think it's ever really been done in captivity without the use of hormones. So me too. Mac says, I've got a 15-year-old goldfish, 14 years and a 75, and it's 7 inches small. I want to put another goldfish in with it that won't get a foot long. Is there any type of goldfish that tops out about that size? So that goldfish is probably just stunted a bit. Other feeder goldfish would kind, could, could, could do that. You could also grow it bigger than that if you tried to. Um... I don't know of any that I can recommend. Like you basically have feeder goldfish, Sarasa Comet, and Shabunkins that all kind of fit in that. Maybe a Waken or a Walken, and maybe mostly those. And you don't want to you basically want single tail goldfish with single tail goldfish and none of the like clumsier goldfish with them so they don't get out competed for food. But in general, if you want to raise a smaller fish, 
hold food back a bit. And what I mean by that is like, don't just feed these things like they're water pigs, like feed them a trimmer diet. And over time, they'll be lacking a little bit of the protein and stuff they need to reach full potential, which some could argue that's cruel. Some could argue that like, well, seven inches and 75 gallon, that's a paradise. Like that's a great life, right? So I'm not convinced we always need to grow things to max potential. Like it's been proven, or I shouldn't say it's been proven. I have seen firsthand fish raised in very large aquariums that at old age are doing worse than they would in the wild just because they were never meant to live that long. So I'm not convinced that all goldfish should be 14 inches or, you know, whatever we want to say what that max growth is. Um, you know, kind of the same thing when you see ridiculously big goldfish out in the wild like should they be that big like is that even healthy you know we it's i think it's more important what are you enjoying you know within reason like obviously if you enjoy you know killing goldfish every 10 minutes out of cruelty like well maybe we all don't get down with that but in this oh i'm keeping a goldfish in a 75 gallon tank it's been alive for 15 years i can't sit here and be like how dare you when the next 40 people kept it alive for seven months before they killed it, right? I think you're doing an okay job. Do what's going to do well with you. And I think another single-tailed goldfish would be well for you. How thick is the acrylic on the 800? It's one inch thick and real heavy. Yep. Does anyone know of a stingray light that is waterproof or resistant? It would be easier for me to put the light a few inches above my water line. Uh... I would recommend a Fluol 2 or 3.0 dialed down. I did see a light that looked like a Stingray in China that was waterproof, but uh, I'm still waiting for samples. Like, so this is how long it can take sometimes is that I saw it back in April and here I am like, we're still talking with the company to get a sample. Like it, it just takes that long sometimes. So like, cause I want to test it. You know, I'm like, oh, I saw it. That looks cool. Okay. Let me see. Cause then I would have to like test it. I loved it. I had to buy a truckload, you know, and then I would have to get it. I personally would want to get UL rated. So that way it's like, okay, it's not going to burn everyone's house down. And then we would sell it. That's like, so that's, we're probably like a year away. And by then there's LED lights that are twice as good. You fool. Will a freshwater planet tank still cycle when ammonia is consistently high? Uh, depends on what the definition of high is, but for the most part, yes. My first question is, why do we have consistently high ammonia? If you're doing a uh, fishless cycle, just stop. It, no, just don't. Don't do it. Clearly, like, normally I tell people, just plan it, the tank and cycle it that way. It's a better method. But for you, it for sure is a better method if you have a planted tank already. Just get plants growing really well, and then when you add fish, they'll just consume that waste. Like, you don't need to do straight ammonia and those plants at the same time. It's just, just don't do it. It's bad. In my opinion, it's bad. It's bad. Don't do it. I'm visiting Washington for spring break. What would the best day or time of the week to visit Aquarium Co-op for the least traffic? Uh, typically, that's going to be like a Wednesday or a Thursday. It would be least traffic uh, in the store. Weekends, train wreck. Mondays, train wreck. Kind of Tuesday to Thursday. I think that's... I mean, we're still busy every day, but those are the least busy. You'd get the most bang for your buck out of that. Welcome, Lindsay Penrose, to the team. Yes. Uh, purchased a 3.0 from Aquarium Co-op and can't find any recommendation on guides or settings. Uh, just set it to, like, plan a tank for the most part. Like, it kind of already comes, like, it's ready to rock and roll. So I would just like just set it there like you could the problem is like you could bring down whites for instance and keep red super high so that your red plants popped a little more but you would only want to do that knowing that you had enough light to begin with and that you really valued reds looking more red and like a lot of times people are like I'm gonna get super fancy with this thing I got algae problems what should I do and my answer is like go back to the standard mode oh it fixed the problem like in general we don't know enough to make things better we typically make things worse as humans like like what are the odds that you or i make a better setting than the team of scientists where their job depended on making the best settings for growing a plant for instance like they already paid people to do the work logically they probably did a reasonable job 
not that I'm not saying no one else could ever come up with a better one, but I'm saying, let's say a thousand of you guys all go, well, I'm going to make a custom flu ball setting. The odds are only one of you would do something that's possibly better than what they had. And 999 of you made it worse than what it was. And if we don't know how to quantify who made the right one, really, we're just all making it better probably. So, or making it worse. I said better, but I meant worse. I was reading the word Boston and then I screwed it up. Can velvet be treated the same way as ick? Not in my experience. Usually to treat velvet, I have to use cupramine, which is a copper-based product, or really heavy levels of salt. Both are pretty invasive with the fish, and I don't have a good method that works without killing a decent amount of fish, so that's why I don't teach people how to do it. Like, it doesn't seem like a good idea. Like, I'm going to teach you how to kill half your fish, but you save half of them. So, yeah, when I if I had a thing that was like, oh, man, almost no deaths ever, I would be like, hey, this is what you guys should do. So yeah, you, like you never want to be the guy that's known for like, I did what the guy said and all my stuff died. Now I hate him. He's such a hack. Like that doesn't help anyone. So even if I'm like, I put all these disclaimers, like every day, every day, 10 people email us and go, I watched your video on the quarantine meds. You said that it's safe for all fish, plants, and shrimp, but is it safe for this? And I just like face palm. And be like, did you watch the video? What I say? Guess what? My answer is still the same. Yes. Like in everything I've ever put with it, it has been safe. So yes, in the video where I said it's safe, and now in this email, it's safe. How many milliliters in a pump of Easy Green? One milliliter. If you're talking about the standard Easy Green. If you're talking about the Nano, it is uh, one one milliliter. Also, I believe. And I think iron and carbon are two milliliters. I'd have to like, I'd have to sit and think not on the fly, full of bright lights to make sure that was all 100% true there. Okie dokie. It's bedtime on the East Coast. I hear that. It's like dinner time for me. I am hungry. Do I plan on stocking or can you order the new Fluol 32 and a half? We've already sold like six of them. So, yes. I love that you consist, or I love the consistent way you educate people on critical scientific thinking. I think it's just the way I like to think. And then I'm just here. What was that saying I came up with? I haven't said it since I wrote it down. What's the saying? I'm not here to change your mind. I'm just here to share mine. Yeah. So I just like to share the way I think about things. And then I have found it to like treat my life pretty well. And other people seem to say, yes, that is good thinking. I like doing that too. And so, yeah, but it drives some people nuts. Like, there's no scientific data behind what you said. You're right. There's not. I never claimed there was. Well, can't listen to this guy. We should listen to, well, no one's done that test, but someone should. And then we should listen to that person. You know, that type of thing. So I just try to, I try just to show you guys what I do and what works for me. And then if you get tips from me and they work for you, then it's probably working. Like the, the reality is the more things you guys do just like me, when I give advice, it should work really well for you, right? So if you're used to cooking a certain way, like let's say you're really good at deep frying stuff. If you start taking tips from a baker, it might start screwing up your process. But if you start taking tips from someone else that deep fry stuff all the time, you might get really good, right? Kind of vice versa. Same thing. If you're using intake sponges, you're using Easy Green, you're doing planet tanks, you're keeping the type of fish I keep. When I administer advice, it's much more likely to be applicable to your situation. Whereas if you're only a saltwater aquarist, a lot of what I say makes no sense for you. Like, oh, if we don't do that, no. There will be things that do apply, but in general, that's who I can resonate the most with is people. That's one of the reasons I don't keep saltwater tanks. One of the reasons I don't do all these things is I want to make sure I'm still staying, um, you know, I'm still, I'm still staying relevant to who my customer is. Like it doesn't do me any good to be like, guys, I'm all about thousand gallon saltwater tanks. Now all the following I've built up, all the advice I've given is going to be irrelevant in a year because all I talk about is saltwater. Like there's a reason it's not that I would never be interested in saltwater. It's that I have a job to do. And my job is to make the freshwater hobby better, bigger, grow it, bring more people into it, learn more, right? Like that's that's what I consider my job to be. 
And so, yes, would it be super fun to do that for like six months? Yes. But would that reset me back maybe a year, a year and a half of work? Maybe. I don't know. You know, I'm not saying I would never do it, but those are some of the thinking that goes into the way I think and that kind of stuff. So Terrence says, what's up, Corey? How many times a week should I realistically dose my seven and a half to 16 gallon tanks with easy green? Once, probably. But the problem is, without knowing lighting, the reality is you should dose once and figure out what day it runs out of fertilizer. If it runs out on day three, you should dose twice. If it runs out on day six, just dose once a week. If it runs out on day 14, dose once every other week. And each of those tanks will be different, by the way. Every plant's going to consume at a different rate. So, careful with that. Bogies 11. I want to set up a six-foot tank with a bunch of all varieties of dwarf garamis. Is it possible? Should I get all females? Will there just be too much aggression? This enters into a realm of, I don't know. I would suspect from logic that if you put a bunch in there, it will work. And even if you have a bunch of males, a bunch of females, if you have a bunch, I think it'll work. If you put 17 in there, it'll be a bloodbath. So know that, like, I want to do something that people typically don't do. You need to go headfirst into this thing. You need to be like, I'm at 100 plus dwarf garamis in this thing. Like, I know you can do that with betas and that kind of stuff, and they're both anabantoids. Like, I, I believe it could work. But also, if you have 100 Dwarf Garamis and it's a bloodbath, what's the backup plan? Like, can I give them to a store? Like, I know this. If I keep a bunch of Dwarf Garamis in a 20-gallon tank at the store, they don't fight. When we get down to five, mm, territorial city in there. They're fighting, and i got to order more to bring up the numbers so they don't tear each other up. I would operate under that same principle on the 125, knowing that I don't know the outcome, but my educated guess is this will get me there. And then I'll evaluate. That's how I would run that. Alrighty, Roo. We are basically at 7 o'clock at this point. Not too much more to talk about. Let me see if I missed any super critical super chats. Mmm. Maximum amount of Galaxy Rasboras in a 15 gallon tank with 20 red cherry shrimp? Probably more than you want to buy. Probably like 50. And you're going to go, you can't keep 50. Maybe you can't keep 50. I know I can keep 50 in 10 gallons of water. So, you know, it's one of those things that how much do you really want? Like, same thing. Like, how many cheeseburgers can you eat in a month? You might be able to eat, let's say, 90. One for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. The reality is maybe you only want to eat a cheeseburger for lunch and dinner twice a week. So the, the answer is actually eight. Right, but you could eat one for every meal, and on top of that, you could fit them in for snacks too. Like just because we can eat 120 cheeseburgers in a month, doesn't mean that's the number we're looking for. So you want to quantify it with like, you know, maybe your maybe the actual question you want to ask is, how many uh, Galaxy Rasboras might be enough to look okay in a 15? I'd be like, ooh, get yourself like 10, 10 or 12, right? That might be the answer you were seeking, but the question you asked led me down led me down that other path. So, yeah. All right, I think I've answered as many things as I'm going to answer tonight. I'm getting hangry and hungry. I'm instantly going to find out which PCI slot I have available and order an Ethernet card so I don't get any bandwidth issues again. I apologize for the tech problems. It's bad enough you got to listen to me and my brain slow down. It's another thing when we have technological problems. That's right, technological. When we got technology problems going on, it just adds another layer of boo, boo this man. Uh, but I do want to give a special thank you to everyone that did re-up, not re-up, subscribe, became a member. Because that member thing, I do have a direct email communication with uh, Google at this point about memberships. I kind of do want to be like, hey man, I grabbed myself 20 more memberships. What's that mean? Can I get into this beta program? What other ideas you got? How else can we bring things to the fans? Uh, so I do appreciate you guys for doing that. I appreciate all of you guys that even show up. I realize not everyone's in the same financial situation. I realize that a lot of you can't even do it. We had someone from uh, Algeria. Their country won't even let them become a member. I get it. I, I'm super appreciative in any way you choose to participate in what we do. Uh, so yeah, genuinely. And that's not even like, you know, he just says that because he really wants the money or anything like that. Like, the reality is I'm genuinely appreciative and I try, I think that comes across when I meet you guys in person 
Because when I meet you in person, I have no idea if you spent $10,000 with my company or $4 or never, only watched one video, never met me before, and you all get the same attention and the same, like, uh, what am I trying to say? What word? Um, I guess pleasantries, all that kind of stuff. Like, you're all equal, right? And so only in here is there like, oh, there's technically, you know, a little bit of like segregation based on, oh, someone's super chatted, someone's a member, someone's a mod, someone, you know, but which I try to keep it, this is the honest thing. I keep it as fair as I can while staying in business. That is a true statement. Now you can spin that any way you want, but at the end of the day, if we go out of business, everyone loses. If I stay in business, most people win. Notice how it wasn't everyone wins, most people win if I stay in business. Everyone loses if we go out of business. That's what I can say. So thanks for chipping in, guys, any way you can, whether it's watching, liking, subscribing, sharing, being a Facebook person, being an Instagram person, being a member, doing all the things. We'll see you next Wednesday. We might have a special guest. I don't know what time that guest lands, but I'm picking him up. That's a good point. Maybe I have to pick him up while I'm supposed to be live, so maybe it'll be a different time. I don't know. Click that like button on the way out, and we will see you next time. If I can find the button, which I wasn't ready. I already said next time. There it is. Goodbye. Getting creepy weird now. Could have hit the button a while ago. Still here. Now you get to see the creepy weird voice. All right. Bye-bye.